Children's Hospital Stanford and have been a member of the chamber uh, for quite some time. So we're always glad to be in the community and, and involved. So we will start, um, today's this panelists will be presenting on affordable housing and we will certainly start with our mayor, Patrick Walker. Hi everybody, thanks for coming. As many of you know, this is a subject that's really dear to my heart. I have been working on it since um, the mid-90s, off and on. <laughs> I was a planning commissioner in the 90s when um, we put together our first component of our, BM, of, our, of our affordable housing toolbox, which was to start collecting um, below market rate fees that we have used to leverage many, many units um, over time. We want to create and preserve and improve our range of housing opportunities to serve an economically diverse community. As many of you know, diversity is one of the things that when polled, almost everybody brings up as one of the characteristics of Mountain View that they really treasure. And kind of the backbone of that is having a range of housing that supports a variety of people. So the city funds and supports an inventory of affordable renting projects for families, seniors, low-wage workers, and um, develop me, developmentally disabled adults. For instance, we just approved an, um, a new project that is going to focus on veterans, uh, particularly homeless veterans. Um, it'll be just off El Camino, and it should be breaking ground, I think, in, within six or eight months, I think. And um, we have, uh, we have over 1,200 units of affordable housing. And we have 127 that were constructed in the last three years. And we have an additional 233 affordable units that are in the pipeline. Now, I think it's important when you hear these numbers to kind of know what's the context of that. We have, um, as I understand it, about 15,000 rental units in the community that um, are subject to, that were bought before 95. We have about 3,400, I think, units altogether, 34,000. So, so this is a big, um, so this 1,200 units is a big component of our 14,000 rental units. We have really worked hard to get to this point, and we, we, you know, our, I think the current council, and really once for the last number of years have been very devoted to this. Um, so I, uh, I thought you would um, like to hear about kind of what are some of the tools in our toolbox. We like to have as big a toolbox as possible and as laws change um, and uh, customs change, uh, people's interests change, we can add more things to our toolbox. But we have a below market rate in lieu fee for ownership housing. So that means if you build condos, um, or you uh, you have to put three percent of the sales price into uh, either market rate units or a fund. Most people have chosen to put it into a fund because uh, the cost of housing is so dear in Mountain View that it doesn't usually pencil out for them to actually build the units. We have a rental housing impact fee, um, and uh, that. Again, is if you want to develop rental housing in the city of Mountain View, this is one of the fees you pay. Um, and over the years, it's, uh, it's brought in quite a bit of money. This, currently, there's about $3 million in it. But we've used that to leverage. Uh, we've, that has been the one, I think, that has really gotten us the most uh, uh, money over the years. We also have a housing impact fee for retail and restaurant and hotel development. That is fairly new, um, uh, but uh, it's, again, we're adding to the, um, the, the lexicon of what we can do. And then we have a housing impact fee for office and industrial development. I think that's the newest one. And um, the first one was uh, uh, passed in the early 90s, or the mid 90s, and it had to be modified because there were some court decisions that dramatically limited what we could ask for. And um, that's one of those is called the Palmer decision, and that's still really a huge stumbling block for um, funding affordable housing in California and 
There's off, there are often bills in the legislator, legislature to sort of get it overturned. I think there's one now, but today it hasn't happened. So that would be a great thing for the Chamber of Commerce to advocate for. Um, I, uh, I thought you'd, you'd like to, this has got a lot of numbers on it, and um, I'm sure that the slides will be made available to everybody afterwards, but I think what we, I just wanted to show with you is some of the recent projects that we have, how, um, a little bit about how the units break down. You'll see we have some that have some pretty big bedrooms in them. Uh, the Franklin Street Apartments, for instance, that's a family-oriented one. So we have, we have, we have um, uh, three bedroom units as well as two bedroom units, which are you know, less normal in, Mount, in the Mountain View uh, market. And then we have a studio, um, one that is really for more slightly towards single people. Um, and uh, um, just a ride variety. Another thing about this that I want to bring to your attention is the city subsidy for unit. Um, this is an expensive proposition. Um, the, the family one was almost $250,000 per unit. And um, I think the, uh, the one we just passed for um, the veterans was about 175. I don't think it's on here. But you can see that it varies. It's varied from about 101,000 to 246. Now, if we <coughs> renovate something, that costs less money. So that's a good thing to do. Sometimes we, we, we there's been some projects over time we've renovated, and that's been less. But when we build them from the ground up, uh, they're very expensive, and um, so. Uh, we need to be very, very wily in getting together the financing. And it turns out that um, our, uh, our staff has just gotten to be incredibly expert at this over the years. And um, we're even, uh, we're even um, uh, identified by Housing and Urban Development as one of the cities that really does this well because we, uh, we do such a good job. But this is a, this is, um, this was one for the Rome project uh, on East Evelyn. Again, that's the family. Uh, that's the family affordable housing unit. That's real near. It's near the railroad tracks and kind of behind uh, Tide House. It's a beautiful apartment building, and you can see that there. First of all, there were tax credits. These are credits that businesses can get, um, so they contribute the money. Then the city of Mountain View puts in um, our money. Uh, that was $21 million. That comes from the funds that um, we, uh, we, you know, we collected in the BMRs fees. And then there's a loan. There was a loan we had to make. Then the city community capital is another way that, that um, uh, private enterprise contributes. There's investor capital um, and deferred interest and fee waivers are also another financial instrument that have turned out to be very valuable. Now, in the future, we also are um, beginning to see that affordable housing can be used as a uh, community amenity. So some of the new developments are including um, contributions to affordable housing as a community amenity. And um, I see this as you know, a very promising thing, considering all of the development that's going on in Mountain View. So um, we um, we view we view affordable housing as a very very important component of our housing program, and we are really concerned with how expensive housing has gotten in our area, and are really committed to doing our part to increase the supply of housing. We certainly can't do that alone, but we really want to do that. Um, so we want to increase the supply of housing just generally and particularly as much as possible the supply of affordable housing. So um, right now we're considering about 10,000 new housing units in the North Bayshore area. That's in the EIR phase. So um, we don't really, depending on what comes in that report and after many council decisions and community decisions, it will, we'll see how that pans out. 10,000 is the max. 
Um, a goal of 20,000 units in the North Bay Shore will be affordable. 20%. Uh, I'm sorry, 20%. 20%. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, that is uh, a very ambitious goal, but we think that it's, um, it's doable because we have some very interested corporate partners who are, you know, who are willing to help us with this. And um, then we, we also find that another way to get people to put in more affordable housing is because of the, um, the FAR bonuses, the floor area ratio bonuses. In other words, they get to build a denser project if they put in a larger concentration of affordable housing. And in the North Bay Shore Precise Plan, um, in particular, there are two, uh, two ways to do that. One is the tier one bonus floor area ratio, and um, one is the tier two with 20% and 15%. And that, um, that is a, you know, I think was a really innovative um, thing that came up through the Precise Plan uh, process and, uh, we, you know, we're hoping that it will pan out. There's always this gap between what do we put in the zoning ordinances and what actually gets built. And um, <laughs> but we have uh, we have set policy so that we encourage affordable housing in as many ways as we can think of. Uh, that said, we're always open to new ideas. Uh, so as uh, new things become possible, new ideas. Uh, new ideas are brought to us, we will be glad to consider those um, because this is definitely one of those things where it's a toolbox and you want to have as many things in that toolbox as you, can, as you possibly can. And um, so every, every time, if you, if you hear of a new tool, please bring it to our attention um, because we want to be as, um, as strong in this program as we possibly can be. So, I think that's all I had to say. Any yeah. other questions? Or is that we're we're going to get the end. Okay, make sounds sure. good. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your attention. And um, I'm also delighted that you put me in front of Joseph Minion <laughs> because going behind Joseph <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Schoenfeld. Yes, that is a compliment. Speaking of Supervisor Submitian, uh, next up is Supervisor Joe Submitian. Great, thank you very much. Hi, I'm County Supervisor Joe Submitian, and I represent the 5th Supervisorial District, which includes all of Mountain View. Uh, some of you will know uh, if you're active in the BIP. Uh, I was last uh, in front of the BIP. I think three, four months ago, we talked about transportation. We joked in our office that uh, you give us all the easy problems to solve, transportation and housing, and uh, you know, we're going to do our best in 10 minutes to tell you what that is up to uh, on that front. The, um, the particular issue that I was asked to share some information with you about today is the housing bond that the county has voted to place on the November ballot. So when you go to the polls or fill out your uh, ballot in November from the comfort of your own home, uh, one of the things we will be asked to cast a yay or nay vote on is a $950 million bond measure. I want to just sort of do the basics first before I get into the background about what the thinking was behind this. $950 million, that um, would be raised by an ad valorem property tax. Now, ad valorem, for those of you who remember back to the Prop 13 debates, means it's based on the value of your property. Key determinant here is the assessed value of your property. So many of you know that there's a big difference in most cases between the assessed value on your property and the actual market value. Uh, it would be $12.66 per $100,000 of assessed value. The typical home in Santa Clara County, the median is $571,000 of assessed value. So you're looking at roughly a typical bill for a homeowner of about $72 to try and put this in context. So to begin again, $950 million bond measure. Where does the money come from to pay off the bonds? It comes from an assessed value tax of $1,266 per $100,000. Typical homeowner would pay something like $70, $75 a year. And then the obvious next question is, and what would that money be used for? And the answer is $700 million of the $950 million 
would be used, concentrated, focused, and I want to underscore this, for individuals who are extremely low income. Now, what does extremely low income mean? I could tell you that it means 30% of the median household income adjusted for family size in Santa Clara County, uh, or I could just say you have a cheat sheet right in front of you. Uh, if you look at the Silicon Valley at home inside cover, there's a really helpful display of sort of what the income levels are at various levels of affordability, what the affordable rents are, so on and so forth. They, uh, so 700 of the 950 goes for extremely low income, and it will be focused on what's known as supportive housing and rapid reentry. I want to come back to that in just a minute for those of you who are saying, that's great, what does that mean? Completely. 100 million would be devoted for, for folks who are very low income. Another 100 million would be devoted to folks who are in the moderate income category. And the last 50 million would be for first time home buyer assistance. Now, Candidly, there was some political back and forth between business interests in the county who were very interested in making sure that if there was an effort on the ballot that there be some allocation for what we would describe as workforce housing. That had to be balanced against the desire of our board and the county to address the pervasive problem of homelessness for folks who are at the absolute bottom rung of the ladder. And that's why 700 million, the bulk of the funds, are dedicated for extremely low income folks for what's known as permanent supportive housing and rapid reentry. What are those two things? Permanent supportive housing is about housing that involves not only physical shelter, but an array of services wrapped around the occupants of those units to make sure that they stay out of homelessness. And then rapid reentry is just what it sounds like for folks who are on the margin, who may suddenly find themselves homeless. The goal is to have resources available to make sure let's get them housed right away before homelessness becomes a permanent life for them. The county has a particular interest in doing this on your behalf, our behalf, all of us, because the folks who are homeless, and we have probably 6,500 who are homeless on any given day in Santa Clara County, even with our shelter system, probably 4,500 of them are unsheltered altogether. Those folks end up being what we call frequent flyers in the social services world. So they are the folks who end up out on the street, they end up doing the ambulance calls, they end up showing up at our hospitals and here at El Camino as well. They end up being heavy reliers on our social services systems. Many times they end up in the criminal justice system, particularly if they've got mental health or uh, substance abuse issues. So part of the thinking about focusing these resources on folks at this end of the continuum is to say, not only is this the right way to address homelessness, because the homeless first model says people are more likely to be able to get their lives squared away if they have a roof over their head and can focus on these other challenges in their lives. But it also says one of the ways we can save taxpayer dollars, do a better job of managing public funds, is by taking them out of the criminal justice service system, out of the social services system, and not having those additional costs that form the taxpayers. So that's why the focus is there for those 700 million. The other 100 million, 100 million and 50 million are geared more towards what we would call workforce housing for uh, very low income folks, moderate income folks, and for first time home buyers. Um, the hope and expectation is that over a period of time, the money will be leveraged, and I will tell you this is the key in my experience to housing money. If you just say, well, what would $950 million buy? It sounds like a lot of money unless you divided it by $1.5 million for the cost of a single family home these days, and said, well, that doesn't really sound like a county solution. No, it doesn't. So then you have to ask yourself, can we use these funds to leverage other funds, other public sector investments, other private sector investments, other state and federal housing programs? That is more and more challenging, frankly, because as Pat mentioned earlier, we have some of the tools that we used to have that are no longer available. And we have a, a greater difficulty with inclusionary zoning now. We have the loss of the redevelopment agencies that used to provide funding for affordable housing. So the notion was, in the absence of those tools, and with a particular focus on folks who are struggling the most and who end up costing us the most in the system, can we focus that $700 million on those folks and really have an impact? And I believe we can. 
The hope is that we could leverage these funds to produce 5,000 units over a period of time. The bulk of those units, as I say, being focused on folks at the lower end of the continuum. That is a real dent on the homeless issue here in Santa Clara County. I'll just close by saying when I came back to the county after having been in the state legislature for 12 years, I was a little bemused to discover that we were coming up on the end of our 10-year plan to end homelessness, and it was pretty clear that that wasn't going to happen. I was then even more bemused when the next thing that showed up to my desk was a five-year plan to end homelessness. I thought, well, gee, if we you know, didn't get it done in 10 years, I'm not sure what, uh, what, what the solution here is going to be in the next five years. This actually is perhaps the most promising thing I've seen in terms of ending the potential to end or nearly end homelessness in the county. If we can create literally thousands of units for the least among us that are either supported with supportive services or available for folks on the edge who need rapid re-entry into the housing market, we will have done a significant thing. The additional increment is there to make sure that we don't miss opportunities that will present themselves for workforce housing. It will require a two-thirds vote. The polling that was done shows that it's a near thing. Could go either way. And just briefly on the sort of the politics of it to close with that, I think there are two schools of thought. Uh, about this. One is that the November election in 2016 is likely to be the most receptive electorate for a measure of this sort, and that that's why it's critical to go forward now. There is an opposing view which says, you know, there's a limit to how much folks will support. We've had city measures in some cities. We've got the transportation tax that's going to be on the ballot. That's a sales tax that we've talked about previously. Is too much, too much. And I think we'll find out in November uh, whether or not one political assessment was right and the other political assessment was wrong, or whether or not it's you know, possible to move forward with both, or neither, or one or the other. And happy to take questions when that happens. Thank you. So I was just reminded that elected officials are very busy. And so if there are questions in the audience for either Mayor Showalter or Supervisor Smidian, we will allow a few minutes for questions. And I see, and try to keep the questions the state, please. <laughs> um, I have two kind of sort of dovetail um, for either one of you. Has there been any talk about creating better toolkits or publicity around existing apartment owners using the HUD vouchers? Because one of the challenges is people wait years for a HUD voucher, but then they can't find any units because no one's willing to accept them. And so, you know, while we're developing all this new housing, and I agree there's a need. I, I want to be assured that we're aware of other housing resource assistance that's available and how we make sure that those things are integrated into the community. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a, not represented today um, is the housing authority of the county of Santa Clara. And um, just to be clear about this, in spite of the name, the housing authority, county of Santa Clara, <laughs> is not related to Santa Clara County, uh, <laughs> except to the extent that they were uh, formed by the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors almost 50 years ago, back in 1967. Huh. So, um, and, and the members, the seven members of their board, are appointed by our Board of Supervisors. But they are a separate legal entity. They're off in their own building in downtown San Jose. They have responsibility not only for what are sometimes referred to as Section 8 vouchers, but they also create affordable housing units of their own that people um, rent uh, here in the county. Uh, the challenge is that the vouchers require someone to take the vouchers, uh, and that given the current situation, uh, there, there are not enough units to meet the demand of folks who are out there with vouchers. And this is creating, at the Housing Authority, this is creating a sort of a, an unusual phenomenon, which is they're, they're in this housing crisis, they're doing better financially than they otherwise might because the housing vouchers are unused and the funds come back to the housing authority by virtue of not being used. So that's a, a good news, bad news story, uh, mostly bad news. And um, to add to that, in Mountain View, um, yeah, there are very few uh, landlords who will take them just simply because they're, they're for too little money. Um, but in the last affordable housing project, we have incorporated uh, a certain number of Section 8 units as part of the affordable housing um, program. So in the veterans one I was talking about that we just passed up within the last six weeks. So that's a new way we're trying to utilize um, those that uh, we haven't tried before. But we have gotten approval for it. And um, 
So we'll be interested to see how it works. And just a quick, quick side note to this, and I'm sure the mayors come across this frequently. One of the challenges we face in our area is that most state and federal formulas are not mindful of the high cost of living in our area. Mm -hmm. and, and you would think, well, can't you make that case? And I will tell you, having been in Sacramento for 12 years, <laughs> when you look at someone from Reading and say, you should feel sorry for us because we're from Silicon <laughs> Valley, that's kind of a non-start. It just doesn't go anywhere. Um, and you know, Congresswoman Zoe Lochner tells a great story about asking her colleagues, you know, What's a million dollar home like in your area? Oh, you know, we got acreage, we got columns, we've got big white porting. And, and you know, no, no. And it's just, it, again, it's very tough to get these state and federal programs. Um, some of them are adjusted for cost of living, but um, even, even so, uh, the, the hard facts on the ground that folks face here is very different than what people talk about uh, in Sacramento. Oh, okay. Yeah, I had a question about the difference between below market housing and affordable housing, because they're sort of being used interchangeably. And then my second question was, for the mayor, for the city fees, you said there were about $5.4 million in fees, but how, what were the total development costs? There was no context for that $5.4 million. How much do you know? Not exactly. The, the office um, cost per square foot, that just increased from, it was about $10 per square foot to $25, but overall, yeah. If you if you want to send me an email, I'll get that question answered for you. But I don't know it off the top of my head. Okay, because without, without context, it could be a very little bit of money. It could be a reasonable amount. It's hard to tell. So, what about the difference between affordable housing and below market housing? What's the definition oh. difference between those two? Well, that's a really good question, and um, it's one that affordable housing is. Um, uh, there is a uh, a uh, formal um, definition for that, but that's not what people usually use. Usually people use affordable housing much more loosely, like you know, housing that you could afford. So you really have to know kind of what context you're using it in. If you're using it in the HUD um, context, they have, um, it's housing that people of a certain income can afford um, based on 30% of their, uh, their income. And, but for most of us, when you hear it bandied around in, um, in uh, news articles or just people talking, most people mean, you know, what can people afford? Some people um, have used the phrase attainable housing instead of affordable housing because that's a way to clarify. But, but it, it's, it's, it's something that you, you, have to, you have to check when you're talking about that because it's used both ways, just sort of the generic word affordable and it has a specific de definition in height. One more question. I, 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 will you be staying until the end, either one of you, or do you have to leave earlier? I'll wait until the bit yeah. Okay, so one more question, then we'll move on with the presentation. So the I have a, a question for Mayor Pat. In the goals, uh, you noted that one of the goals of the city is preserving housing opportunities, serving economically diverse communities. And so my question is, what are we doing in the city to preserve uh, affordable housing? current affordable housing, and then the second question is, at North Bay Shore, affordable for whom? <laughs> Take 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we do, uh, the housing staff does um, keep track, uh, try, try to keep track of the uh, apartment stock that is likely to turn over and be sold, and um, work with apartment owners as opportunities arise to purchase those apartments um, and refurbish them. <coughs> that is an ongoing part of their job that they've been doing really I would say for 10 or 15 years. Um, the Marcy Freeland uh, um, was development was a, a great example of that. Um, so that's kind of an ongoing thing that's done in the background and um, Affordable to what in the New York Bay Shore? You, uh, you've just hit the nail on the head. I mean, a lot of it is going to be market rate housing. We have put um, requirements in for a certain amount. Uh, if they have higher density development, it could be 20%, which would be great. But um, yeah, market rate housing now is, to me, when I look at the rents, I think, those are very, very um, prosperous individuals. 
Thank you. I know you know the background of my question. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you. Keep, keep asking the questions. <laughs> it's important. <laughs> and I love the engagement. We're going to move on with uh, Pilar Lorenzana Campo with Alti Director Felipe Nelly at Home. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. My name is Pilar. Um, and maybe I will stand because my neck is incredibly short and does not twist the right way. Um, I'll try not to obstruct people's view. Um, so I'm Pilar Lorenzana Campo. I am the policy director of SV at Home. See many um, familiar faces. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, for those of you, uh, can I get a show of hands? Who has not heard of SV at Home? Okay, that's shocking to me because we're only 12 months old, so thank you. For the three folks that need an introduction, SV at Home is the new advocacy organization. We are focused on increasing the stock of affordable housing for Santa Clara County communities. Um, two weeks ago, we turned a year old, uh, so we have spent the last 12 months really working with many of you to try and build the advocacy infrastructure for Silicon Valley so that we can scale all of these solutions. Um, I was told not to talk about the problem because we all know about the problem, so I'm just going to set a little bit of context. Um, I think what's really interesting, so the title of my presentation is Housing for All in Silicon Valley, and as um, Supervisor Samidian alluded to, the, um, to, to this, um, the perception of Silicon Valley is this, um, that we have four out of the six um, most valuable corporations in the entire world in our backyard. Um, what people don't know is we also have um, our average white collar wages in Silicon Valley are 53,000. This is from research that was commissioned by Working Partnerships. And for those of you that are furiously trying to take notes, I will send you a PDF of my PowerPoint. Um, the other thing is um, even lower, the average blue collar worker wages are $19,000. Um, these are the folks that serve us our coffee, these are the folks that clean our bathrooms, that drive our buses, um, that perform many, many, many um, important services that may allow us to enjoy the quality of life that we have. Um, the average tech, work with, um, tech sector wages are pretty high, they're $113,000. But if you factor in the cost of living, um, the median rent in Sunnyvale is $37,000. In order to, sorry, three. Oh, did I just? Oh, okay. No one shoot me if that actually happens. Um, the median rent is close to three thousand eight hundred dollars per month, and as um, Mayor Showalter was alluding, affordable means you only spend thirty percent of your income. So for this to be affordable to you, you would need to earn one forty nine. So even the average worker is a tech worker who we think is like super lucky. It's still not enough. Um, as a county, um, what the state measures how much housing we build every seven years, in the la and then it requires us to build a certain amount of housing depending on the income group. Um, the seven years ago, in the last seven year period, we as a county only built 27% of our affordable housing need, but we overbuilt what we needed in terms of like market rate housing. Um, and we have heard, and I agree with this, I work, I, prior to coming to Silicon Valley at home, I worked at the regional level in all nine counties, and I think Mountain View um, and this council and this board of supervisors, um, lately we have actually seen so many solutions being um, proposed, and you know, we're trying to solve this problem, but in the last seven year span, the city of Mountain View, they only produced 13% of their affordable housing requirement, and also exceeded their affordable uh, their market rate production. So I think this is a pattern consistently that we're seeing across all cities and all nine counties. So what that means is that we have really built up so much of a pent up demand for housing across all spectrums except for the wealthiest of us. So SV at Home is really driving the creation of affordable housing for a more vibrant and equitable Silicon Valley and we're trying to do this in three buckets. One, focusing on funding. Um, the three buckets that I'm gonna talk about, these are the three main barriers to increasing housing and affordable housing. One, the lack of funding, which we've heard quite a bit from today, about today. Um, apparently my arms are also short. Uh, <laughs> access to land. Um, I mean, an acre of land could go for as much as $12 million. There's no way an affordable housing developer can compete with that. So there are strategies specifically that we can do to focus on that. 
Um, and the ever important land use, land use, what you can do with your property, what you require people to do with it, who can live in it based on the regulations that you adopt. And last but not the least, um, this is called a new conversation. I was going to change this. This is actually about community support. Um, and I'll talk about why that is a big problem in a little bit. So from funding, like I said, I think the city of Mountain View um, has um, really uh, done a lot in terms of like collecting the right type of tools that we need. Say, for example, um, there's a lot of, there's history in the city for leveraging, for collecting housing impact fees. And recently we heard that the city just adopted a commercial linkage fee, both of which, which are really important tools in your toolbox. Um, and then we heard supervisors maybe even talk about um, really a, a historic housing bond. We have never seen, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, we have never seen a housing bond in Santa Clara County. And as a region, we have never seen a housing bond at this level. So I can't stress enough how really important it is um, to have all of your guys' support as we're walking into November um, and have your vote. I understand that the ballot is going to be a very long ballot because there are so many measures and people have been telling me to remind everybody to look to the bottom of the ballot and vote for the housing bond. Um, but in addition to all of these local tools, um, there are also some new regional funding sources that are being proposed. Um, so I'll mention really quickly because the gentleman talked about preservation. Um, today, um, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission is deciding whether they are going to start a new fund. The new fund is going to be available to the region. The new fund is called NOAA, which stands for Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing. And the plan is to use this fund to prevent um, or to save uh, affordable housing developments that are kind of like at the timeline, they're going to expire and they're going to become non-affordable. So if this fund is put in place, um, a jurisdiction and a nonprofit housing developer can kind of tap into this to preserve affordability for a longer period of time. Um, and then further down the line, um, there are also conversations about um, are there any other regional tools at the nine county level or at the five county level that we can be working on, whether those are housing trust funds or whether they are um, different types of commercial linkage fees. Um, so this is just to say, so, um, Supervisor Smidian and I were chatting about like how now we have this one potential tool, right? We have the $950 million bond that we might have, depending on how the vote goes in November. Um, but it's really important to remember that one tool isn't going to do it. Um, what we need to do is we need a full array of solutions because we need a full array of housing. Um, we talked about affordable housing for whom. And that actually is the question because of how expensive it is to live in the Bay Area. Pretty much many, many, many people, even those that you might look at and think don't need affordable housing, actually do. Um, and then the last thing I will say also, I know I'm really cognizant that I'm talking to members of the city of Mountain View and the Mountain View Chamber, um, but there isn't any, um, this is really not a Mountain View problem. So what this means is that all of the other cities and all of the other counties also need to put these um, solutions in place, and I would encourage um, many of you to try to join some of those conversations about how to solve this together with Sunnyvale, how to solve this together with Palo Alto, how to solve this together with San Jose. Because at the end of the day, Mountain View, as much as you do, and you should do as much as you do, um, there isn't one solution, there isn't one city that can do it all. Um, so access to land, um, one strategy I'd like to highlight is um, publicly owned land. Um, the very, so access, it, land is super expensive, like I already said, but there's actually state regulations that require um, that any publicly land, so land that's owned by BTA, land that's owned by the city, land that's owned by the parks department or the school district, there is a state requirement that says that before that land is sold or leased, it needs to be offered to a nonprofit developer first. Um, so that gives a nonprofit developer like a, you know, a way to kind of get into the market um, that might be a little bit easier. If you don't work out a deal with this nonprofit developer, then you can do, you can go down the line and pursue market rate development on it. So I think um, implementing this tool is actually a really good way to make sure that we try to even the playing field a little bit for affordable housing. Um, and then privately held land, I think this is going to come into play um, a lot really in Mountain View, both for North Bay Shore, um, 
because a lot of the hand, land is privately held, right, by corporations that are wanting to expand. Um, but these corporations have a vested interest in having their workers housed too. So the idea is that we need to take a look at our solutions and see what type of like households they match. Because um, like we discussed, like even the um, folks that work in the tech sector, they need homes too. So the idea is that we need all of these different tools. Um, and then, oh, I already talked about that. Um, and land use. Um, so this is really um, familiar to you. What I guess I will say is really important, especially in the context of Mountain View is, and Santa Clara County, is we need to think about how we think about density. Um, when I used to work in San Francisco, and then I started working more and more in the Silicon Valley, and people would really like warn me not to use the word heights or tell me not to use the word density. And I think that even in our type of community, there's a way for us to be denser. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a 20, 15 story, 30 story building, but it also doesn't have to be a single story or a two story, right? So I think that if we can think about how to maximize our land a little bit better and start to think of something as three stories, four stories, Six stories, I like that, especially in the context of when it's being served by public transit. I feel like that's a really responsible way to use our public dollars because then um, we can make sure that um, lots more people are using the infrastructure that we build, spend money on and build. Um, and then I'll talk about the last one. So the last one really is about community support. Um, you all have probably already heard this, but there are so many examples where um, there is a project that is being proposed. The project is supposed to bring in 200 units, 300 units, 10% of those units are gonna be affordable, but then the community comes out to reject the project, right? Because the project will cost traffic, the project will cost X, Y, or Z. So there are actually like a lot of myths that are driving this pushback against housing. And um, the, the pushback exists for both non-affordable housing and market rate housing. There's just a lot of like, um, there's a lack of community support and community acceptance, I think, for um, bringing more people in. Um, and so that is really something that we as a county and we as a region need to start working on because as Mayor Schulter said, like at the end of the day, what you all want is you want a diverse community, right? Economically diverse, racially diverse, diverse in age. Um, and so without, a community, without that sort of community support for these types of projects, um, that's just not gonna happen. Um, I think I violated my 10 minutes, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Maria Martin, um, Executive Director, Day Workers Center. Yeah, thank you um, to the Chamber uh, just for allowing us to be here and present this another tool into the back, trying to resolve the issue about uh, housing and how to protect uh, and working towards uh, diversity. So um, we came to this um, situation trying, we approached the city council trying to resolve the displacement of the community, or be part of the community. So we worked for many, many months just trying to, uh, the city approve some uh, relief for our community. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. So then uh, we came with um, the community together and uh, organized this uh, incredible task force of uh, volunteers and just uh, with amazing collaboration also for the really savvy experts in the area like I stand for community of clinic and all and based on the best practices in the area about rain control. So we came with this proposal that uh, is going to be in the ballot for November. So, um, as I said, uh, the display is in the community. I'm really close to my community working as a day, day worker center. But I really was very surprised what I learned when I was doing this collecting signatures for uh, many days and hours. And just to hear the stories about teachers, the stories about uh, people who serve in the city um, who are not able to continue living here because they need to move who knows where. So people who came uh, to move to San Jose and it still needs to come and work in here. Mm -hmm. So just to hear stories about uh, business owners, like that they are not able to really 
even uh, provide good services to the community or the customers because the lack of a worker, because they are not able to come and serve in this community. And what's very surprising to me, so that makes me just kind of a wonder, so um, that really is the, real, the, the good thing to do. So we know like a 68% of the residents in the city are renters. So, and like uh, all of them has this big impact in their lives, it's something like that we need to address. And I'm very proud to be part of this community in Mountain View, that when we see a problem, we immediately uh, don't let it go. We really try to face it and work on it. And um, is how uh, we come to this uh, proposal. So basically, uh, this uh, address three big solutions or uh, issues. Like, uh, is uh, going to have only one uh, increased rent increase per year, so that is really predictable for the people who needs to make uh, some adjustments for their uh, budget and their budget. And it's going to be no more than 5%, no less than 2%, so it's tied to the uh, consumer price index of the inflation. And I know you are very familiar with all these terms. But uh, and the other part is also uh, just cost for eviction. So we have been noticed like uh, without this protection, people is really vulnerable, vulnerable even to ask for some uh, fixer in their in their apartments or in their houses because it's no it's easier for the landlords uh, just to evict people and just to avoid uh, just fix this fix. Uh, the houses or the apartments, and uh, even later, just increase the rents. So we find out like a, a just cause for eviction is really, really important in any uh, potential uh, protection for the uh, the tenants. Uh, and then the second part is really also very important because provide to the city council just helpers, just to be talking about housing, and this is the creation of rental uh, committee. So that is, uh, is has like uh, five members of this committee who is going to be appointed for the city council, and then they are going to hold, uh, they are going to have the responsibility just to uh, talk about uh, the tenants, the landlords can go to them when they have some dispute, for example, and they need to increase the rent because the landlord has uh, some make some major improvements in the building, and then they need to raise the rent. So then this committee will be uh, able to listen and decide. And then on the other hand, so the tenant also can go and just said, you know, uh, my building needs some improvements, really. I just have the agreement and I have two parking spots and now I just am able to use only one. So I need only reduce to the rent. And then the committee is going to be able to say yeah, and yes, in and, and, and different, different cases. So very much is kind of a, our proposal is going to be addressing, and um, uh, it's very important for me uh, just to explain how uh, difficult and badly needed is this solution, and what this charter amendment is really uh, the best possibility for continue in supporting our diversity that we know is very important in all, for all of us. So, um, um, thank you. Next, we have Isabella Chu, founder of Redwood City Forward. Um, I have to stand up too, so I can slide. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm uh, on the steering committee of Peninsula Forward and founded Redwood City Forward, and the purpose of these uh, organizations is really to broaden the conversation around land use policy and, and try to really uh, inform the debate with, or the discussion, I should say, with evidence. Um, so how I really started thinking about this was that I was doing a lot of hiring. Uh, I was managing a large group at Stanford uh, School of Medicine, and I found that uh, hire, uh, when I hired research assistants, housing played a really big role in recruitment and retention, and also what I had to pay them. So. Uh, an RA at Stanford makes about 20% more than the same job at Berkeley, even though uh, NIH funding stays flat. And the reason you have to pay a Stanford RA more is because of the cost of housing. Um, and it's the same way with faculty. Faculty have an expectation to live close to campus, and so every time we talked about recruiting faculty, housing came into the conversation. 
And Stanford was also losing research assistants and administrative associates because they lived in, they often live in outlying areas and they were taking jobs closer to where they lived, which is a completely rational thing to do. So I thought, okay, you need to really think about housing close to jobs if you want to stay prosperous and feminine as an organization. Um, but really what got me to care about this is there's actually a really large and growing body of evidence and literature around how where we live impacts health. And this is a, uh, and this is you know, my day job coming out, but uh, this is a slide uh, from a, a paper published by Mark Cullen and Vic Fuchs uh, in PLOS One. And it's a kernel plot of the probability of surviving till 70 for every county in the US where there's enough people to make this calculation. And what you see is a huge dispersion. So if you're a black male in one of the poorest counties in the US, you have less than a 40% chance of making it to 70. If you live in Santa Clara or San Mateo, that probability almost doubles to 70%. And you see the same pattern for every other group they've looked at um, with varying degrees. So Raj Chetty has done a deeper dive on this. And um, he really looked at, you know, if you control for race, uh, and just look at income, how does where you live impact your health? So we looked at uh, life expectancy, and women and men, um, women are more resilient to social adversity, and there's a lot of research going into why. <laughs> 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 around 55,000 a, <laughs> 55, a year, uh, you just need to make more. So the lines converge, and the more you make, the longer your life expectancy, and it doesn't really matter where you live. Below 55,000 a year, they start to, to spread out, and you can see that where you live makes a big difference. And this pattern is even more uh, striking for men and that the lines start to diverge at around 70,000 a year. So at the lowest end of the income uh, ladder or spectrum, um, there's about a five year difference between a, a place like Detroit and a place like San Francisco or New York. And to give you a sense of the magnitude of this effect, if you eliminated cancer in this population, you'd only see a three-year gain in life expectancy. Mm. So, How many years? Three. 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 So this is a huge effect. And, it, and it's a little bit counterintuitive, um, at least it was to me. Um, and then Raj Chetty also looked at what happens when you move from a low-income or low-opportunity area to a high-income area. So in that first plot, if you move from the left to the right. Um, and the, the impacts on the kids is stunning. So what you see is a monotonic uh, dose response that for every year of childhood that that kid spends in the new place with more opportunity, more resources, their income goes up, their probability of going to college at age 26 goes up, family formation goes up, and just about every good outcome we know how to measure improves. And then it kind of peters out at around age 23. And so if you're going to move, move when they're young. Um, so I, I feel like Making room in prosperous places is one of the most powerful public health and anti-poverty measures that we have available. So how do we do this? I mean, you guys all know this. Um, the, the demand is, you know, why is it so tough? The demand is strong. There's lots of good jobs. It's prosperous here, and the supply is short. Uh, you know, we have limited land. We have economic incentives to build offices instead of housing. Uh, there's a high regulatory burden, although Jerry Brown's trying to tackle that. Uh, as alluded to before, every time a big building of housing goes up, there's a huge amount of neighborhood resistance, uh, and it really makes it tough to add housing. Um, to the point where we have about a 1.3 to 1 job to housing imbalance, and in places like Palo Alto, the epicenter of expensiveness, that's about 3 to 1. Um, so how can we get more housing? And there's a lot of policy tweaks that will just improve supply uh, and improve affordability. Um, so one is allowing for height. We just have to do it. Land is expensive. Um, another is allowing for greater density. And there's a lot of work going on in looking at um, what's called missing middle housing. That means things like duplexes and fourplexes and small apartment buildings that really preserve neighborhood character but allow you to get a lot more people uh, in, in a given area. Mixed use, um, so you know, jobs and, and housing close together. Um, but the one I really want to talk about today is ending parking minimums. So uh, going back to human-centered design, uh, you can see on the left is downtown Mountain View, and it's very walkable, and you see all the shops, and it's very pleasant. And then you've got uh, housing and offices kind of above. 
And on the right, what you see is car center design. And car center design really came into play. Uh, the laws and the policies changed around the 30s, but really cities started being built for cars in the 40s to the 70s. Uh, so what you see is a giant parking lot and the building way in the back. No one would ever want to walk here. Um, and then the same thing happened to residential uh, design. So you see a parking lot, a garage scape, and the housing in back. Whereas on the right, you see much more dense uh, housing. And I would say it's much more attractive. Uh, you know, it's right up to the curb. There's no minimum parking. And it's close to amenities and, and a desirable place to live. Um, and, and really how I started thinking about you know, cars versus people and designing cities for, car, uh, for people instead of cars was that I wanted to convert my garage to a little apartment. It's cheap to do, um, you just need a good contractor, and I bike, so my garage is empty, so I thought, ah, why not? Um, and this is what that looked like. But it turns out this is illegal. So for my little <laughs> two-bedroom, and why you, know, you need to be resilient? <laughs> <laughs> my little two-bedroom, one-bath tract house. I have to have a 20-foot setback in front, which allows for two cars, and I have to provide a two-car garage. And if you think about it, this is a housing guarantee for cars. Mm -hmm. And in the most brutal housing market in the country, and I would argue one of the top in the world. Cars have better housing protection than people sure. do. Oh, That's true. There's no guarantee that I can provide an apartment for my parents or my child, and I can't have the option of providing housing for humans instead of cars. Hmm. So I thought, this is crazy. Has anyone studied this? And it turns out that it is one of the most well understood and most studied policies there is. And everyone who's looked at this in a rigorous way thinks that parking minimums are a bad idea. Uh, and they're a bad idea for a lot of reasons. They encourage sprawl, they degrade the landscape, they um, subsidize driving to the uh, detriment of other forms of transportation. But the biggest thing they do is they displace people and they drive up the cost of housing, particularly at the bottom end of the market. Mm -hmm. And the way they do that, and these two uh, pictures are from the same residential neighborhood in Seattle, is that um, on the right, you see an older building, and again, it's right up to the sidewalk. You've got you know, four, four uh, stories of housing there. And on the left, you see something built in probably the, between the 50s and the 70s. And first, you see the setbacks. You lose some housing there. But then the entire bottom floor is parking. So you lose, lose an entire floor of housing. And I would also add that it degrades the look of the building, because now you have to pave the setbacks so that the cars can get in and out. Um, so now we've not only lost supply, but the developer has to get the same amount of money from fewer units, and so this incentivizes higher end units and it incentivizes uh, what well, it, it drives the price up. Um, so if you want one policy tweak that will really make a difference, I'd say any parking minimums would probably do the trick. Um, so my, the reason I think this will work is because businesses have a very strong incentive to get the balance and the price right. If they don't, they lose customers or they lose tenants. And if they do make a mistake, they have the flexibility to either work with somebody nearby or to lease out their parking and to find the right balance and the right price. And it's a much uh, more responsive system. Uh, so in conclusion, human-centered design is an economically productive way to build cities. People rent apartments, <coughs> people go to restaurants, people patronize businesses, cars do not. Uh, it makes room <laughs> for people. Uh, it reduces commute time to improve uh, retention and recruitment of the best uh, employees at every <coughs> income level. It's hospitable to people, it's walkable and bikeable, and I would say it's beautiful. So in conclusion, people make cities interesting and prosperous. So that's why we should make room for more. Thank you. So Rob Hollister is not here, but he has sent a video. Or will be with us via video? Mr. Hollister spoke on, on housing and thinking of it a little differently. So this is just a quick setup on this on this thread talk. Is there a certain number one? Yes, it's that one's right by here. Um. while here. Um, those of you who interact with Sobrato usually do it by touching one of these three organizations, which 
historically have operated largely separately. Sobrato Development, that's the real estate organization that I work with. The Sobrato Family Foundation, that is our main philanthropic organization, or Sobrato Capital. Uh, and Sobrato Capital is our non-real estate investments. Um, and what I really want to talk to you about today is a question we're working on and struggling with, which is, should an organization like ours, which is committed to high quality real estate development, philanthropy, has substantial financial resources, and is committed to long-term investment, shouldn't we be able to do more than these three groups individually can accomplish? And how can we do more as one organization rather than three separate organizations? And to dive into that, I really want to start with our family foundation. They, they came up several years ago with a mission statement that you, you see here. Make Silicon Valley a place of opportunity for all of its residents. And what I really want to talk about is how can we make that the mission statement for all of our organization. Bringing all of us together under an umbrella, call it Sobrato Philanthropies making Silicon Valley a place of opportunity for all its residents. Now, many of you may know the Sobratos have committed to giving away at least half of their wealth to charitable causes. They've committed to do that entirely locally, uh, and that's why they have Silicon Valley, which we define as the entire Bay Area, as the focus of our opportunities here. Um, when you think about the real estate development, which is what I'm here to talk to you about, think about it in terms of at least 50% of the profit we develop. Uh, through real estate will wind up in the family foundation. And I don't see a conflict between profit and nonprofit. I see a synergy between profit and nonprofit. When I think about this, uh, I first want to look at the history of how we've been doing it. And I think you all know an enormous amount of wealth has been created in this area and around the world through real estate. And many families, not only Sobratos, have given much of that away. The Sobratos are uh, part of this, what I would call the original model of real estate and philanthropy. Um, for us, it started in 1991. We developed the Apple Work headquarters. In 1995, we sold the headquarters to Apple. Uh, and a year later, we founded the Sobrato Family Foundation with much of the proceeds from that sale. And since that time, we've given almost $350 million away, profits from the real estate organization to local causes that the Sobratos uh, support. Uh, John Sr., our founder, likes to say we make the money over here and we give it away over there. And that's great. Um, it's been a fantastic model, but honestly, it doesn't create any more synergy than investing money that's been made through the stock market or through a tech startup into philanthropy. There's no synergy between the real estate uh, and the philanthropy. It's merely funding it. It's also inefficient, and I say this with Jerry Hill looking at me here. I apologize, Senator Hill, but uh, much of the money, when we do it this way, goes to taxes. And taxes are important. I'm not saying they aren't. But most of our taxes go to things outside of the Bay Area, the federal government and the state government. The Sobrato's mission is about the Bay Area. We want to keep as many of those dollars working here in the Bay Area. So we thought, there's got to be a better model. And as time went by, and our real estate portfolio aged, we found some ways to do that. Um, we used to develop lovely buildings like this one in 1977 in Milpitas. Um, and over time, these buildings became obsolete. And we started tearing them down and building uh, newer, bigger buildings that met the need of the technology community. But at the same time, rents went up. And nonprofits in this area were faced with a really terrible choice. Either spend more and more of their budget on rent, or move farther and farther away from the local populations they're trying to serve. Not a good choice at all. And the Sobratos came upon a better idea than tearing down these buildings, which was giving these buildings to nonprofits. And 461 Valley Way became the first Sobrato Center for Nonprofits. We give free office space to local nonprofits. We host meetings for nonprofits who don't have conference facilities of their own. And we did this in 2002. It was shortly followed by San Jose in 2008. And right here in Redwood Shores, half a mile from here in 2012, we now host 71 nonprofit organizations rent-free in these three centers. Last year, we hosted more than 8,000 meetings for nonprofit organizations at three, these three centers. So this is what I'm going to call the improved model. It's more efficient. There are no taxes involved. It directly addresses the needs of the nonprofits. And there is a real tie between the real estate. Now there is synergy. The real estate and the philanthropy are working together. But it's still not perfect. We developed 461 Valley Way in 1977. It started serving nonprofits in 2012. It took us 25 years to get there. 
This is philanthropy after we've wrung all of the value out of the real estate. And that's good, that's nice, but we gotta be able to do more. And so we ask the next question, how can our projects more directly and more immediately address the barriers to opportunity in Silicon Valley? And I go back to that. Remember, what we're trying to do is create opportunity for all residents of Silicon Valley. And there were three areas we thought we could focus on. Traffic, housing, affordability, and education, which sounds kind of familiar after hearing our other speakers. Um, how is this about opportunity for the residents? Well, think about it for a second, the working parent. You've got a child struggling in school. They'd love to get home and help the, the child after work, but they're stuck in traffic, or they're driving an hour and a half from the Central Valley to their job. The school's under-resourced, can't provide after-school help. So that's the trifecta for that family. They're having reduced opportunity because of housing and affordability, traffic, and educational problems. So what are we gonna do about this? How can real estate development help these three issues? Let me start with traffic. Historically, real estate development is treated as an impact that has to be mitigated. Our entire sequel law is developed around this idea that essentially development is a bad that you have to make it better. But we believe real estate can be part of the solution. And the key to that solution is mixed use. And by mixed use, I mean specifically putting housing next to office space. Great to have retail as well, but it's the housing and the office space that we think is key. You get less traffic, shorter commutes, less commute pollution, more vibrancy. Um, this particular project, and I've left the, the cities out uh, of my slides here. None of these projects are fully approved by the cities. I don't want to presume that they will approve these projects. But I do want to explain what we're thinking. I think this project is located in the single worst location for jobs housing imbalance in the entire Bay Area. This area has about 30,000 jobs and 300 housing units, 101. What we're doing, working with the city, is planning 240,000 square feet of office space, but next to it, 650 market rate apartments, 110 affordable housing units, sharing parking, sharing open space, sharing amenities, and by doing this, we're going to take 133 cars off of the road every day. Not versus what would have happened because of this development, but versus now when there's nothing there. Overall traffic is going to go down. Pollution is going to go down. This project will be the equivalent of planting five acres of forest every single year that it exists. We are now planning housing in every project on the peninsula where the city will allow us to plant housing, whether it's 100% housing or it's mixed use. Every project we do where the city will allow us has housing. So what about housing? Uh, we see this as the single biggest threat to our economic prosperity here. I've actually never heard of traffic destroying an economy. Go to London, go to New York. Housing could. You've heard about that already today. Um, this is a site, oh, no, actually, to just address that, we believe you need uh, more supply at all levels. Market rate affordable all levels. Um, but I want to be realistic. The fact that we're going to build an apartment next to this office building doesn't mean the receptionist is going to sell his car and move into a $3,000 a month apartment. And yes, it takes $3,000 a month rents to build apartments in the Bay Area. That's just the financial reality. So what we're trying to do is to partner with the cities to make affordable housing accretive for both the city and for us. How do we do that? This is 15 acres of land that we own. 11 acres has this great mixed use zoning that I'm talking about where we are not only allowed but encouraged to build housing next to office. Uh, we get to build more if we build both. But the vacant lot you see on the right hand side is four acres that can only be built with commercial, industrial, or office space. If we build it per zoning, we'll build 400 market rate apartments, we'll build 600,000 square feet of commercial space, and we'll pay impact fees that will fund the construction of 40 apartments, but with a catch. You still have to have the land. The fees won't pay for the land, and buying land in a transit-served location like this is almost impossible for housing developers. But what if we can take that great zoning from the left hand of the site and move it to the right hand of the site? Now we have the same zoning, and we can build the same market rate apartments. Remember, we need housing supply at all levels. We can also build, not fund, not pay fees for, we can build and actually deliver 120 affordable apartments by partnering with one of the great developers uh, of affordable housing in the Bay Area. And we only suffer a mild loss of 30,000 square feet uh, of office simply by changing the zoning. It's a win for everybody. The city gets 
a more vibrant, mixed-use, mixed-income development, we still have a project that will be very profitable and will fund our family foundation for the next 50 years. Education. <coughs> education seems a little less directly involved. Um, the, the Serato Family Foundation has been a huge supporter of education from its inception. Many of you may know the SEAL program, which is a, an early reading program that was started here in Redwood City. Uh, and while we give money to that every year, we're, again, looking for a new model, a more efficient model. Here, you've got uh, a chance to partner with an organization that promotes education, uh, that has land, but it doesn't have cash, and it doesn't have real estate expertise. This land is owned by the Diocese of San Jose, uh, and we're partnering with them to build 100,000 square feet of office space and 12 rental units. Uh, and this will provide a million dollars a year, at least, to the parish, uh, which you see the church behind the, the building there, the historic church, and the parish will have at least a million dollars a year to fund its mission, which includes the local parochial school. And we don't see this as only an opportunity with private education. Uh, our public schools are real estate rich. Most of them are underdeveloped, most of them are one story, but they don't have the expertise and they don't have the cash. And we're looking for opportunities to partner with them to either create a cash flow or to part with them, uh, partner with them for even more creative ideas, like developing affordable housing for their teachers so they can attract and they can retain teacher talent, which has become such a problem for them. Now, none of these projects exist yet, and we have challenges. And we don't know if it's going to work, but we're trying. I, I want to touch on some of the challenges. Um, sometimes we have like-minded groups, but we run into what I describe as making the perfect the enemy of the good. Sometimes by insisting on 50% affordable housing, you end up getting no housing at all. Uh, there are neighborhoods in San Francisco insisting on 100%. There is no housing that's going to come when that happens. We run into competing values where I see 12 acres of open land and I see a mixed-use development with housing and office space and cash flow to fund our, our foundation for the next 50 years. Other people see parks and they see sports fields, and I, and I appreciate that. Just different values. And we do face the fear of, the, of abuse. The IRS is making it harder and harder for our profit and our nonprofit arms to work together. And unfortunately, it's because people have abused the nonprofit side. But we're trying to work through these issues. Um, and we're optimistic. And as we go forward, um, I'm really hoping that you all don't think about Serato Development or the Serato Family or, uh, Foundation, but you simply think about us as the Serato Organization. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? We'll go with the, um, I just get your name, I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Gautam Dutta, from the Big Senate Election Chamber. I have a question for, um, for some questions, maybe. You know, you, going back to the bond measure, in terms of the funding for housing for extremely low income, where will the, are they going to be, um, units built off existing units, or will it be off land that's currently not being used for housing at all? Too soon to tell, okay. granular detail there. The one conversation we have had at the board level was about the importance of this happening on a county-wide basis. And there's a little bit of a, a tension there because uh, on the one hand, there's, uh, you know, the way to get the greatest number of units is to go where the land is least expensive. Uh, well, the land is least expensive in places where the affordability crisis is not as great. So it would be um, expensive to come to Mountain View or Palo Alto. On the other hand, that's where the problem exists. So you got a little tension back and forth in terms of location, but we have talked about the fact that the fund should be spent in County View. And because I know you're short on time, and because I know we've only got five minutes, and because I know that the VIP is going to take this up in a few minutes, I want to get this opportunity, and thank you, for a quick commercial. <laughs> You're business people. You're going to ask yourself, what's in it for us? You should ask that. We should have good answers. I hope when you're thinking about whether or not you support the bond measure, you're saying, OK, yes, we're good people, and yes, we have good values, and yes, we value economic diversity in terms of the values of our community. But in terms of the interests of the business community, you need a workforce. Every one of you knows what it's like trying to hire qualified people at every level of your organization. And part of the challenge is that they can't find a place to live. So that's in your self-interest as business people. One of the challenges you struggle with as business people, of course, is the traffic that we've talked about. And you just heard how important having housing in close proximity to the workplace is in terms of mitigating, to at least some degree, the traffic problem. 
And then in terms of public safety, the next time there's an earthquake, the next time there's a flood, and there will be, there's an obvious question, which is, who's going to be here the next day that actually has the keys to the building, knows how to get the electricity started, can actually provide the services that all of us need? And if it's someone who lives in Tracy, which I believe is going to be the safest place in the state to be because they all seem to live in Tracy. Uh, <laughs> you know, if it's someone who lives in Tracy, they're not here to help us in that moment of emergency. So apart from the values-based argument that I would make with you all, if you're thinking about whether or not you want to support this for what amounts to 20 cents a day uh, for a typical homeowner, you got to ask yourself in terms of economic self-interest, whether or not you need that workforce, whether or not you want to see traffic mitigated, and whether or not you want to be safe and secure the next time there's an emergency. Sorry, that was cheating, but I had the opportunity to ask I would try to do the same then. So also, just as people of business, I just want to encourage to just to support our ballot and the measure, uh, ballot measure, because the same reason. So you are, uh, we need people who live, really can live when they work, when they serve. It's very important just to conserve our diversity, uh, our community values, and it's a great opportunity for all of you to come together and uh, use this wonderful tool that is going to be a November ballot. Another question? Who didn't have a chance yet? Of all of you? <laughs> oh, okay, great. Um, this is a question for, for anybody uh, who um, on the panel who could handle it. Um, something that hasn't been represented here today uh, is the viewpoint of the landlords uh, who, um, to some extent, are, are the proximal cause of this crisis. They're the ones who have been raising rents. Uh, I refuse to believe that they are all just avaricious predators. Um, is there uh, someone on the panel who can uh, give some summary of what their response might be to this crisis? I don't think we have any landlords if we can help with that. Um, how are, have you heard from I am not going to speak on behalf of Joshua Howard, I think. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry. That's, sorry. But, However, because we're running out of time, I am sure there'll be a candidate forum coming up this in a few months. Um, there's an election year, and I think it might be one of the topics. We never know who will be on there, so. August 30th at Microsoft. <laughs> August 30th at Microsoft. <laughs> Last question. <laughs> well, this is for Supervisor Sumidian. I obviously support the bond measure, I think, that inquired thousands of uh, affordable houses. Question one, instead of comment, please. Is, is wonderful. There's an issue of getting people off the streets, and then there's an issue of preventing more people, replacing them on the streets. And in the socioeconomic times that we live in now, there's a huge risk of more people replacing people on the streets that you take off the streets. And I'm just wondering, in, in terms of this crisis, the conceptual approach to prevention. One of the challenges, and you've got some expertise here in the room that I would encourage you to rely on uh, as you have the conversation with reports. One of the challenges when we talk about the issue of homelessness and the homeless is that it's easy to use one term to describe a wide array of circumstances. So we've got people who are chronically homeless. We've got people who are also what is sometimes referred to as episodically homeless. And then you've got people who are sort of on the cusp and when I talk about rapid re-entry housing, that, I think, is one of the things that gets overlooked too often. We tend to think of permanent supportive housing over here, emergency shelters over here. But in the North County in particular, we've got a lot of folks who are just one car repair or medical bill away from homelessness. And so having a, an intermediary a solution that's sort of a tweener in terms of what happens when somebody gets to a bad place in their life, having that rapid re-entry housing, in my view, um, is key, and it's why when this subject came up at the Board of Supervisors, people kept talking about supportive housing, as well they should, but I made a point of underscoring before we voted on the motion, this will include housing for rapid reentry, and that was confirmed by all five members of the board. Wonderful. Thank you so much to our guests. Um,